bid you good day. I bid you welcome. And today I bring to you another topic for your consideration, for your exploration. One that we will say is dedicated to the soul and at the same time from the soul as well. While the soul does not have an agenda per se or only one agenda, it is a development of your being. The soul is always, always interested in your spiritual development. Now the soul does not make this differentiation. It does not consider itself your spiritual part or counterpart. It is simply what it is. The soul is spiritual. Spirituality is the soul's awareness. It is self as far as the soul is concerned. The soul has never ceased to be on a journey. It has never thought of itself as being active or inactive. It has never thought of one life as significant or more important than another. It does not think of one day as more important than the next. The soul is always, always pure awareness, a pure state of discovery, a journey that always is more interesting, more exciting, more adventurous simply because it is, not because it is more than yesterday, simply because it is today. So as the soul develops, it encourages all aspects. And one of the ways that it does that is by choosing one or more paths of development during specific lifetimes. This is done carefully, with great consideration, and also so that there is a variety, so that lives and lifetimes are very colorful, very interesting. Now, what the soul considers colorful and interesting, you may consider from your personality side either a challenge or a hardship. But remember that the soul is on a journey of oneness. To become one, to join with one, to merge, to dissolve, all of this. And it will draw to itself all experiences that it feels are of interest. As we develop this topic for you then it is for you to understand that we will give it the name empowered paths to enlightenment another way to call this is the path of the oath the path of the oath means just that the soul has an oath that it has made with itself not exactly a pact it is an oath it is an oath in which it promises to itself that without exception it will always look upon the greater truth, the greater promise of life itself. So the soul makes for itself an oath, something that binds it to itself, not to another, not even to God. The soul is bound to its own promise to become, to be at one with. And as it does so, it then chooses the variety of paths that we will speak of today and develop them for you, so that in some ways you will recognize yourself in these and perhaps see how to use them to your advantage as well. Now, there are, in fact, an unlimited number of paths that the soul can choose. And yet in each age, and at times for several generations, decades, there are some paths that are more prominent, more important than others. Because the age itself dictates or invites them as well. The changing principles or the laws that govern each age invite the soul to offer itself, to share itself in certain ways. 
and in fact the soul will decide in what world to place itself, sometimes what dimension if there is more than one to be chosen from, sometimes even what planets or other expressions in which the soul can come to know itself or have a deeper understanding. So there is a variety of these then accordingly to choose from, always the goal or the agenda being the same, self-discovery, self-promotion, the journey of the one to the one, threading the eye of the needle that makes all things one and nothing all at the same time. Upon the earth at this time, then, there are several different journeys to choose from, and these are the ones that we will number for you now, giving as many details as possible that may be of benefit to you. In these you will discover yourself at times, for you will see as well that sometimes you, through the guidance of the soul, change from one to another, evolving a certain path, completing one cycle and bringing forward the next. More than likely you will also find some of those that are friends to you, loved ones to you, and more. The first one we will experience then or draw upon is what is called the guru-disciple relationship or the student-teacher, for lack of another word. In this particular demonstration, the soul chooses from among all possibilities a teacher. And all of this then fed through the awareness, through the sciences of nature, the personality then has a certain affinity. Could be to a religious tenet, a truth, a religion could be to a particular sect of spirituality or even to a certain philosophy or even to a certain belief. So here, spirituality takes on a very grand meaning, one that is not necessarily dedicated to God or a God, but can even be for a strategy or a philosophy of life, even one that is predisposed to leading business in a certain way may have a master or a masterful teacher that they follow. So all of these interpretations must be thought of in the grandest scheme. Those who follow then the path of the student teacher, guru, disciple, have among others a favorite. It does not mean that they will never study with anyone else or any other teaching, but something will always guide them back to this teacher or to this teaching. This is their foundation, or this is the most important one. This is the one that has made the most difference in their life or in your life as we speak. Those who follow a certain teacher then hold this one above others, perhaps not above all, but above others. This one is seen to have more answers, more depth, a more understanding of life. This student will more than likely follow a teacher for a long time. In this particular path, one would not necessarily choose a teacher for a matter of weeks or months. In this case, we are speaking at least of a number of years, if not the complete lifetime, at that. Once the relationship is complete, however, it is more than likely complete forever. And so once the student has completed this cycle with a certain teacher, they will rarely, if ever, return to that teacher or that teaching. Why? Not because they have found what is wrong with it, its fallacy, but because they have absorbed it, lived it, breathed it completely. And they will more than likely not abandon this teacher, certainly not without good cause, until all of this pattern is complete. The student then sees the teacher as the one that has answers. The same applies to the teaching. Here is found a good amount of knowledge and wisdom and truth. So this particular path will eventually take the student to their own level of enlightenment. It may take the student then to their own truth, 
to their own philosophy, or perhaps to furthering the one that the teacher began. They may take over the post of this teacher. Either way, this is a path, you see. It is not simply a semester of completion. This is not a vocation. This is a spiritual pursuit. This is the path that the spirit has chosen, that the soul has brought forward, and the personality will see no wrong in it and only justice. Regardless of what others will say, if others will say it is a cult, so be it. It is a particular sect and not general enough, so be it. The student will not abandon the teacher. In some ways, the student becomes more loyal to the teacher than perhaps to their own family members, which, of course, could be reason for concern for those that otherwise managed or directed this being. Although this may seem to you that it is only the path of a follower and not a leader, that for the most part, is an error. For the student follows the teacher with desires to become a master of that teaching, not simply in good favor with the teacher. This student follows and learns and absorbs every last nuance, every small, small detail of life, hoping then to bring forward the very best within themselves and without of this teaching hoping to find the one and the oneness within themselves as well. This is most of the time, at least half of a lifetime. It is not necessarily that a disciple will follow this teacher throughout an entire life, because otherwise they would only ever remain a student. At some time the student must aspire to take over the teacher or the teacher's role. At some time, the student must outgrow the teacher or the teaching, otherwise it will not have suited all of its purposes. So it will seem those that follow this path after a time abandon it. That is not necessarily the case, but on the physical realm, that is what it will look like. It will look like the soul or the personality has said, enough, no more. Sometimes, in fact, they will even turn their back against this particular teaching for a time. But that is only so that it can find a place of rest inside. Again, the student must in some way become the teacher. And at times, it will come based upon an inner or an outer rebellion, sometimes finding all that is absolutely wrong in this moment in order to find the rightness of it later. The next path is one that we will call the keeper of justice. Later you will see that there are other keepers as well, but we will begin with this one now. The keeper of justice in some way involves being a protector, a warrior, or in some way the advance guard for others. Those who keep justice look just for that. They are often ones that will abide by the law more than others. Even when the law is not a sane one or a just one, the keepers of justice will still follow it. They may make adjustments to it. They may seek to abolish certain laws or to change them or to override them, but always by means that would appear to be legal, that in their own way they would be seen as those that keep to just or justice. Sometimes those who follow this path might be bodyguards, for instance. They will guard others, whether they are just or not, their post as they see it is one to protect or to guard. Those who follow this path to enlightenment will turn a blind eye here or there to what seems as if it is injustice as long as the greater good is served. If, however, the greater good is no longer being served, at times they will turn away, even then in a very lawful way, in a very respectful way. So those who are warriors and protectors are also those that you might find in a military post. They are those that may take a military career. Now this may not seem to you 
to be a very spiritual pursuit. But remember that here we are speaking of what the soul has in interest and not simply of moral issues or of what it is to take a life or to give a life. In this particular path to enlightenment, an oath has been sworn by the soul to discover all that it means to keep a word, to keep justice, to protect the pure. And in this way, all is turned then to the self. The self becomes aware as it becomes aware of others or the needs of others. Here you find one that is often in a supportive role, but not always completely, for you will also find those in different ministries, be they of government or be they in other academic echelons or in other aspects as well in which peace or circles of peace or peace bringers are also found then. And so here you will find then all of those who tow the line. Here you will find those who do not deviate from a truth once it is taken, from a vow once a vow has been taken. These individuals will find the middle path or the path to which they have sworn to. They are often very serious individuals and at the same time very devoted. Devoted to others, perhaps to a fault, devoted to others and to their word more than to themselves. Here you will see those that will go hungry in order to feed others or will take care of the needs of others before their own. It may seem to you that they are very selfless individuals. It is not the case necessarily. They are fulfilling an obligation. Sometimes there are those with certain karmic debts for interest and they will choose this path of enlightenment as the keeper of justice because here they are in some ways serving their spiritual understanding while at the same time perhaps, not specifically, not necessarily, but perhaps repaying a debt in some way by protecting those who may have come to harm even inadvertently in another life or in some way they are repaying a debt, cosmic, human or otherwise, by following the law or leading the law or carrying or protecting those that cannot do so for themselves. Remember that a path to enlightenment is just that. It is a path. It is not necessarily the means to the end or the end that satisfies all means. It is one of the many paths that the soul is always, always on. For the soul is determined in all ways to be the sun, the sun of all things. As we continue then, the next path that we will examine is the path of the fallen angel. Now I will describe this to you in detail and give you, offer you other names as well that you may find interesting so that you do not take the title fallen angel perhaps in the wrong way based on the words that have been chosen. The fallen angel's path is also called the path of the innocent. So the fallen angel is not necessarily a dark angel, in fact far from it. This is the path of the innocent. This is the path of the godly. This is the path of one that has been, in fact, and still is within the angelic realms, in the angelic dimensions, in many, many different ways, and at the same time wishes above all to know humanity. Well, the only way to know humanity is to become human. It is the only way to truly understand human nature because I tell you that from the higher dimensions it is very difficult to understand humanity. What is a human? Why does a human do what he does? Why does a human think in such a way or think in a certain way but act differently? Why does a human being go against their feelings when it is natural to have certain feelings? Why abandon these, ignore them, put them to sleep or harm them? 
So the path of the fallen angel is the path of discovery of what is most innocent about humanity. It is a path of service. It is a path as well that always, always remains innocent. In some way, the fallen angel, then, is also the child, the innocent child. These individuals will always seem, in some ways, youthful from within, in some ways very innocent, and at times, the path of the fallen angel, these innocents are protected by the keepers of justice that we have only just mentioned to you. That is why I have arranged them in this list. The innocents, then, those angelic beings, at times are uncertain how to make their way in a human life or in a human body. Sometimes, but not always, these individuals will have certain allergies or be uncertain what to do with something as the common cold, what to do when they become ill, for as angels they were never ill, and so they do not understand illness. They do not understand airborne allergies or foodborne allergies or why a body could be affected and why a body cannot be simply healed. So these innocents at times require others to watch over them or to protect them. And in turn, their very sweet, innocent nature gives to others what they could not have on their own. For instance, the keepers of justice, not always, but much of the time, are somewhat gruff individuals. You see, they identify more with the role that they have than with their individual, more gentle nature. So those that are the innocents of life give to them that which they would not have of their own making. A softness, a gentle nature, a soft touch or a soft word. Innocents are almost always this way, and even if they will add another path, which is also possible, for not only is it possible to change from one path to the next, to evolve, to complete one cycle, and therefore begin another mid-life, these decisions are not always made in between lives, they also happen mid-life or wherever it is most appropriate. However, The innocents will always remain innocents. They will always seem to have fallen from heaven, landing on their toes in some way, even if they also take on another path. This part of them will always be true. So those who have found their way onto this path, the path of the innocent or the fallen angel, find themselves by recovering truths about human nature, in some ways restoring or resetting the clock for others who could not do so themselves. It is a soft hand, a gentle heart that can often assist others in beginning their path again, in restoring themselves or their truth, in opening their eyes or in opening their hearts. So the path of the innocent is also then one of the paths, one of the many paths of service. And the soul has sworn an oath then, in this case as well, to assist as many as possible, even while the angel or the angelic being is learning from others. The next one to explore then is the path of the wisdom keepers. Again, there are certain keepers, as we have said. This one is the wisdom keeper. The path or the oath of the wisdom keeper is as it sounds. It is to keep those things from becoming lost and it is to place them into the hands or hearts or minds in which they most belong. How is it, ask yourself, that wisdom can be kept alive on the earth day by day or century by century, even when it seems as if wars or brutality, or poverties, or hungers, or all of the other maladies of the earth. How is it that all of these have not simply consumed the earth and the earth's fires? Well, for the most part, these paths that we have been describing to you, each with their own purpose, serve the earth and serve all upon the earth, not only the soul, but the grander scheme, the grand design of life as well. 
So those that keep wisdom do just that. They keep it alive. At times it is copied in the figurative way, meaning that it is copied by art. It is kept alive symbolically. Sometimes it is the artful word, sometimes the scientific word, the historic word, or the written word. In some ways it falls to the wisdom keepers to hold wisdom aloft. Sometimes it means to keep it out of the hands that would perhaps do it harm. Sometimes it means to entrust it to others for the next scheme or the next generation or the next age. So there are many wisdom keepers upon the earth now because, as you know, the age is shifting from one to the other, from one to the next. And so the wisdom keepers abundantly are making certain that a variety of it in a variety of tongues and languages and such is being held, is being protected, is being buried, is being translated, offered, stored. The wisdom keepers are very hard at work now, and in some ways their own enlightenment depends upon it, because it is they that will also return in another life or in another age to do the same. The keepers of wisdom then find others in life as well to assist them, to learn the wisdom, to repeat the wisdom, to memorize the wisdom. And of course, wisdom means many different things. It is not only a teaching. A wisdom is a kind of aliveness. It is a kind of magic that makes humankind what it is. It is a self-awareness. So the path of the wisdom keeper, then, is to, in some ways, transmit it, also to protect it, to give it, and, I will tell you as well, sometimes it is part of that path to take it away as well, to remove others from certain positions if they have usurped their power so that power is no longer wisdom. It falls upon these as well to dethrone or defrock as needed, those who do not protect wisdom or uphold it. It falls on them as well to erase memories, to delete pages. All of this falls upon the wisdom keepers, and each one in their own variety, in their own way, do just that. Next, we will say, is another keeper, the shadow keeper. Again, here, if we are not careful, it will become a misnomer. So we must be very careful to say, what is the shadow keeper? Again, it is not necessarily a being that hides in the darkness or to keep the darkness alive. However, the shadows are full of knowledge that is almost on the verge of becoming wisdom, except that it is still in the shadow. So the shadow keepers, for instance, will take a certain theory that has not seen the light of day and in some way offer it to those that can do something about it. The shadow keepers may, for instance, unearth a truth of an ancient time, translating it just so, so that it becomes alive again. Those who are the shadow keepers then travel the paths just between light and shadow, light and dark. They are the ones that manage the balance between these two, neither concentrating on complete goodness nor what you would consider dark. It is the shadow keepers that understand what lives in the shadows, what comes out at night that does not bring fear but brings a truth even to the midnight sun, if it is not to the day's sun. The shadow keeper is a very unique path, and many will not take to it. It is at times these individuals are not well liked. These individuals are not known for their grand personalities. It is rare that they will have many friends, but those that they do have will be very tightly connected to them, perhaps also by a certain oath. 
Those who keep the shadows then also understand and have great patience for those that still dwell in the darkness or those that are still asleep, even while all others are dawning to the days ahead. It is the shadow keepers that often lag behind and with great patience wait for those that still slumber and for those that say or do those things that others would give up on. The shadow keepers are those that do not give up on others simply because they have done or said something that a grand portion of moral society would judge. Shadow keepers rarely judge others, and if it has come to it that the shadow keeper will judge, then woe to those that be judged, for in then, in truth, there is indeed penance or karma that awaits that individual. Shadow keepers then are patient with some and impatient with others, always drawing the appropriate sword or dagger of light. It is the shadow keepers then that understand how to part the darkness, how to see not only in the light of day, but in the midnight sun they see as easily. They see what is hidden in the hearts of others because they know what is hidden within their own. Those who are shadow keepers have often walked the path of the shadow or the paths of right or wrong or have walked past the righteous because they have been too righteous. Shadow keepers are often those who have overcome quite a bit of karmic past in many, many lives, and so they have indeed become experts, not at what lurks in the shadow, but what lives there very comfortably. The shadow keepers then are friends to all that is just, and as friends they will sometimes have keepers of justice as well. A path sworn, this one. Here, this path is in the minority, for you will find that it is very easy for many to judge those who walk in darkness or those who are more comfortable by the midnight sun. The next keeper, then, is the keeper of the sacred, and there must be those of this as well. Keepers of the sacred are also protect in the same way. However, these are individuals that most often protect a certain treasure. A treasure can be a kind of wisdom, but in most cases it is something else. The keepers of the sacred, for instance, might be those that would do their part to ensure that something, a great architecture such as the pyramids, for instance, is maintained, or perhaps that it is not then either abolished or taken away by those that would plunder its treasures. So the keepers of the sacred protect all that is treasure. Sometimes they also protect individuals. The keepers of the sacred sometimes, like the keepers of justice, protect individuals in positions of power, but only if these individuals are truly sacred. So, for instance, a keeper of the sacred might be a monk that follows your Dalai Lama. It may be one that protects a mother and a child. It may be one that protects a certain heritage or a certain foundation or even a seed of truth or even a mine that is known to have many important minerals. The keeper of the sacred might maintain something as simple as a lake so that it remains pure. The keeper of the sacred may be even what you would term an environmentalist, one that protects all that is innocent upon the earth, one that protects one of the kingdoms or one of the elements. In all of the ways, the keepers of the sacred protect as well the earth. They are very linked to the earth and the earth plane, but not in a planetary sense, more in the individual treasure sense as well. Those who have taken this oath have more than likely witnessed its breaking at another time when they could do nothing about it and in some ways they swore an oath long and longer ago 
about this and are only now finding that they can do something about it. So the keepers of the sacred then often as well work for a certain environment or a certain party or a certain project. They may be those that protect the whales or protect other cetaceans as it would be or protect an innocent child or the rights of children or the innocent or those that in some ways do not have rights or privileges of their own. In this way, it is a path to enlightenment as well. To protect another or to guard something is in itself a path to enlightenment. Next, then, we find the path of the universal traveler. The universal traveler is one that has been far and wide, as the name suggests, to the earth and to many, many other worlds and planets as well. The path of the universal travel is temporary where the earth is concerned or where humanity is concerned. The universal traveler then brings with him wisdom from other worlds that will sometimes be shared but not necessarily. The universal traveler is one that will not tamper with what is not his, is one that will not interfere with what does not belong or concern them. Sometimes these individuals are seen or thought to be very aloof and one would say, oh look, he doesn't care at all. Look, he is a bystander and will do nothing about that injustice. The universal travelers are observers of life and their path to enlightenment at times has to do with just that, to observe human nature and as difficult it is not to become entangled upon it, to say it is not my adventure, it is theirs. They have chosen this to themselves, drawn it to themselves. For good or not, they will discover it, each one to their own, just as I have known. So the universal traveler then, aloof though he might seem, is one that will allow each one to have their experience and will in fact assist them in fulfilling that experience. Imagine that one that would assist someone in taking their own life because it is of no longer value or they cannot sustain their physical body, it may be the universal traveler who knows that the eternity of all of life will surely guide that individual to their next step. It is the universal traveler that will say, of course you must fulfill your wish, even if it means to abandon a family that you have thought to support. The universal traveler does not judge right from wrong, better from worse. This one is more interested in the journey itself. How far can you go in a journey? How wide can you see? How many horizons can you study at once? For this one, it is all about the experience, to draw as many different experiences as possible. It is rare that these individuals will remain in a committed relationship, in a marriage, for instance, though they may indeed love and deeply and truly love many individuals. They are the ones that come and must ultimately go, for their enlightenment depends upon gathering and gathering experiences that they can there share with others. They are very committed to supporting the desire of others or assisting others in fulfilling a certain wish. In this they can be counted upon, for they have seen and done and experienced so much that they know where many of the resources are. So when someone might say, well, I have always wanted to do this, but it is quite impossible for this reason or that, the universal traveler will point out all of the ways in which that project can be brought forward or that experience can be brought to bear because they have indeed already attracted such experiences for themselves. The next path is that of the hermit, another word for this being the solitary wanderer. The solitary wanderer is both teacher and student. This one can live only by life itself. 
The food for this one's soul is life and life and life and what life will teach. For this one there can be no guru and this one is no one's disciple. This one is the son of God or the God that is also the son. These individuals at times appear to be, well, solitary, yes, but also lonely. In truth, they are not, but their appearance will be that. These individuals spend a good amount of time alone, by themselves, studying, discovering. Their relationships or associations that they will have will be deep, they will be few, and for the most part, they will be lifelong. These individuals will not share their experiences with many others. There will be one or two or three or ten throughout one's life, but rarely more than that. These individuals will return again and again and again to some of the same locations that they have known throughout their life. They will take themselves to travel they will take themselves on adventure and then return again to the place in the heart that they most recognize, to the same thoughts that are most comfortable, to the same books that they may have read once or many times again, to refresh themselves and to renew themselves, but in the sameness. In the sameness that they explore, they find themselves but a deeper version of themselves. For these individuals, it is not about many and more experiences. It is to take the same ones or even the same thoughts or the same subjects and make them deeper and deeper to study themselves. They are students of life, but there can be no teacher, not for a very long time. There can be certain teachings that they will follow. For the most part, these are from studies that they began in other times. In fact, in other lives where they may have been the guru disciple. For these individuals, the hermits, more than likely in their last incarnation or in their last path, they were indeed the student or the disciple of a teacher or a teaching. Now they have come to develop their own truth. These individuals, similar to the universal traveler, will rarely interfere in the lives of others, if for no other reason than they understand that each one's journey must be their own. They feel that they have very little to contribute to others, but here or there a certain seed will escape them, and there are others that would wish to sit simply at their feet, outside their cave, as far in as they will be allowed, which is not very far, given the path of this hermit. The hermit prefers to be alone, to live alone, to spend hours of solitude, and yet others are very, very drawn to that, because to others this individual appears to be in some way enlightened, although the hermit will make no such move or take any such action or offer any words that offer this indication. But to others, how comfortable they appear to be in solitude, how peaceful they appear to be, even if there is turmoil within, it will not show without. And so to others, these individuals are quite attractive and seem very much like teachers. But the hermit will not take on a student. The hermit will not take on a follower. For he knows that his path must be to wander the regions of his own mind, of his own heart, and of his own soul, and to develop in that way. Further to this, we have the path of what can be called the correctionist or for another word, a constructionist. Yes, well aware that these are not necessarily true words in your time, and yet others cannot be found in your vocabulary other than to describe this. So there are those indeed that have come to correct moments, to correct moments in time or out of time, to make corrections to other times from history that have not made their presence. 
Imagine that there are some individuals that were not given their due in another life. Imagine that there are some that made certain discoveries that they are not credited with. Well, it may not seem that it is so important to correct history in that way, but for one reason or another, it is. And so those that come forward under this path come to correct words that were misspoken in another time, discoveries that were miscredited, theories that are no longer accurate. They have come to tear down walls if they were built incorrectly. The correctionist comes just as the name suggests to change, to correct that which no longer serves, to pave the way for a new age that goes about something more correctly. So imagine that if there are those then that go about removing certain elements from the earth so that it truly is no longer serving, it is those that come to correct this that will introduce certain means or truths by which this is necessary. These are not individuals that come to destroy, though at times they must. If there is no other way to correct other than to destroy a past or a past name, then they will do so, but this only as a last resort. For the most part, these individuals come to correct and to build, for another word, as has been said, is that of the constructionist. These individuals then are the ones that are given tasks to rebuild perhaps certain sacred places or sacred truths or if there be, for instance, tablets or scrolls that were found that contain some amount of wisdom. It is these that are the constructionists then that will piece them back together, offering them to the world again. So the constructionist then a little bit like those that keep the sacred, for sometimes these will know each other and be in association with each other. The constructionist will also build upon a new idea. If there is a smaller truth that serves the moment, these individuals will build upon that truth. They will assist in some way of making it more public, making it more accessible to others. So in this field, you will also find some that are concerned with the literary word, those within the public's eye or the publishing arena, those with an ability in some way to bring forward a truth or to correct something that was not true. This as well is one of the karmic paths that one can choose, not necessarily because they have harmed this path in the past, but it is one in which corrections can be made and in some way they will be credited with these corrections. So it is a karmic path and for that reason it is also one that leads to enlightenment. It is based upon an oath or a promise or the correction of a promise. Next to the last we have the scientist artist. Both of these have put into the same category, you know, though it may seem to you that they are vastly different from one another. The scientist sees form and the artist perhaps sees the formless in the form. And so they are two sides of the same coin, two pages out of the same book. The scientist must find all that is reason and reasonable, and the artist then comes to abstract the reason in order to see it as more than that. So the scientist will create the foundation upon which the artist will stand and reach into other depths. The artist will say what the scientist cannot say. The scientist will put forward what the artist cannot draw. And so these are one and the same. And it may not seem to you to be a path to enlightenment, but it is. For these individuals as well have come to give color to life, to give structure. These are the ones that give to life the form and the formless both. Because of these individuals, life upon 
the earth is possible. And so it is also one of the paths. It is one of the paths to build upon. This is a path of study. And there are these individuals that are truly scientists and students of life that will find themselves upon this path as well. It is the path of the educator. It is the path of the student, the student of life as well. And here you will find those that will stand for a certain truth no matter how long it takes, the starving artists as it would be, the sciences that have no funding as it would be. They will stand for that until it is revealed in some way, eating hand to mouth day by day or what it is for a truth so that it can exist simply for the sake that it can exist so that others might develop it later. So here you have a path to enlightenment then that comes piece by piece. These are hard-earned truths in this way. This is a very slow to develop path, not to those that are in a large hurry to get somewhere in some way will choose this path. It is a lifelong path in this case, sometimes an arduous one. Those that have chosen this path will say that they would not have had it any other way, though indeed the years will often show on these individuals more than it shows perhaps upon others. The last one then on this list is the visionary. The visionary exists for the sake of the vision. The path to enlightenment is a vision that does not exist and that as one comes close enough to that vision, it already dissolves and the next vision, the next sunrise, the next sunset, the next panorama, the next horizon is already present. The visionary in essence brings forward nothing other than the vision. This individual lives for bringing forward a better way, a better life, a higher truth. This one is at times the optimist and at times the pessimist according to what the visions will show. The vision may be optimistic as one faces the west, pessimistic as one faces the east, and these individuals at times are given less than their due in terms of life's credibility. They live between the scenes, between the moments, between the layers and between the dimensions. They belong neither to here or to there. Friend to all and to none, for they are here today and gone tomorrow. Loyal to the higher truths and the deeper truths, but since these are also always dissolving before their very eyes, it does not seem as if they are very present or have much substance. This does not trouble these individuals very much because their visions are so worthwhile that they understand perhaps more than others how tenuous is the present moment, how temporary the present moment. It could not last. It is always giving way to something else. The visionary sees the past perhaps more clearly than others the errors of the past, the wrongs of the past, but perhaps only these serve to open the doors to the future. It is the visionary that sees how to connect the dots between the past to the present to the future. It is the visionary that says, if you go that way, it will look blue, but if you go the other way, it will be yellow, and the middle path is the one you may choose. The visionary rarely gives guidance to others but can describe what is in the forefront of someone's life more accurately than any other can. This path to enlightenment, then, is a circular one. It is not a path that appears to be going in a certain direction, and in truth it is not. It is leading back to the center. The visionary lives in a kind of a labyrinth choosing one day left and the next day right, knowing that one day he will emerge from the labyrinth, but not trying terribly hard to find the most direct path. 
the visionary then sees all paths as one and one as many different choices. He is rarely in a hurry, perhaps only in order to see the next vision. Aware that he will one day reach the center again, that is not the goal. It is simply the mystery of life that will one day reveal itself. And so it is indeed these individuals that structure themselves in such a way <clears throat> that they will never tire of life, that they will never tire of a humanity that is not theirs. It is these individuals then that without doubt and without aim will always seek for the next moment and the next truth. Perhaps as you have seen, the earth has need of all of these different paths. Perhaps you can see that all of these different paths serve not only human, but the soul and the earth. All of these paths are well directed for this particular time. And in the next age and in the new era, other paths to enlightenment will open themselves, reveal themselves. Some of these will evolve into these other paths and perhaps another day we will see and explore how these paths, just as archetypes, will develop into the very next time, the very next age. Perhaps you have found yourself here. Perhaps you have found your truth. Perhaps you have found your own wisdom or path to wisdom, for there are many. The paths sometimes overlap. Sometimes one, as was said earlier, completes itself midway through a life, and the next one is chosen by the soul. Or sometimes it is even the self that chooses, for in the path one finds the natural next progression of self as well. More than one path can be lived simultaneous, but it is more rare. It is more rare. It is more accurate to say that one will follow another, or that there can be three in a life, but that one must be complete before the other. Always there is one that overrides the others. Always there is one that seems closer to the heart, deeper in the truth, more present, more necessary, more vital. But it can be, as has been said, that more than one is explored as well. Indeed, sweet ones, it is hoped that you have enjoyed this topic and that you have found within yourself another aspect of yourself that you may not have heard or not have discovered as of yet. More to add to the great unfolding story of the soul of the human and the human self and the soul self. Until the next moment. I bid you good day.